race and we're very uh, pleased to be joined by Mark Wattsworth here in the studio, anti-racism veteran campaigner as well as Jackie Walker online. Um, we thought we'd do this a bit different. I mean, the, the last six, seven years in the Labour Party was all about racism, wasn't it? One particular form of racism, anti-Semitism. Um, but we think it's actually time to revisit how we on the left deal with racism in our own organisations and how we deal with issues when somebody says something racist in our organisations, etc. And how we should organise uh, um, with with black comrades and with, with other comrades. So we, we wanted to go back to some of these basic, basic questions. And um, I'm going to start with you, um, Mark. So we've, we've, we're asking three, three issues we would like to discuss. Um, and I'm, I'm taking a sort of a devil's advocate position a little bit. I'm obviously not black, as you can tell. I'm very white. I have not the experiences that you have. And I work very closely with Jackie Walker and she often tells me off that, you know, she, I don't see things sometimes being racist when in fact they are and you experience it in a totally different way. So I'm coming from a position of wanting to learn and wanting to understand why, you know, you think, for example, it's important to build uh, uh, black sections, for example, from orthodox Marxist that I am, I'm thinking that divides our forces that, you know, that puts black people into a section and takes them away from the white people who could probably learn something from having the close interaction with black people and, you know, being taught and, and vice versa. Do you think it's, um, it's, it's a good idea for, for black people, women, you know, all sorts of oppressed people to do their own sections? I think it's called self-organisation. Mm. We have the self-organisation of the working class, which I'm sure is a Marxist mm. you wouldn't be opposed to. Mm. trade unions, the labour movement, and within that we have to recognise that there are uh, differences of race, of gender, of sexuality, disability, ability. And those sections of the working class have every right to self-organisation. Mm. It makes sense. They have conversations together, they debate what issues they want placed on the overall agenda of the class, that's not divisive. The women's section, the youth section, we said there should be a black section for African, Caribbean, Asian and other people of colour so that we can caucus and organise for power. Because this is about power and how it's distributed. Uh, I think it's about rights, it's about representation, but when I say that, I don't mean tokenism. And I would challenge some people who use this term ID politics, identity politics. You and I have had discussions about this before. I can understand why if we're just talking about gender, if we're just talking about race, if we're just talking about sexuality, and we're not really interested in the class dimension, that's not my type of politics, that's not mm. your type of politics. I believe in the race and class dialectic and that we learn from that. Lenin had a very good position on uh, the Black Republic and the national question, which you'll be mm, familiar yes. with. Otto Kusinen, my mother's from Finland. Otto Kusinen was a very important figure in the communist movement during Lenin's time. And he put Otto Kusinen in charge of the commission to look at the national question and particularly South Africa, and they came out in favour of the Black Republic, as you may be aware. It's in my book, Comrade Sack. I'm going to plug my book now. The new edition is out. Comrade Sack, Shapoji Saklat Rala MP, a political biography. It's actually the 100th anniversary mm. of Saklat Rala being elected to Parliament in Battersea North as the Battersea Trades Council and Labour Party candidate. He was also a communist, uh, and an and, and outward communist and accepted as the Labour candidate on the basis that he was a communist, because up until 1924, you could belong to the Labour Party and the, and the mm. Communist Party. But coming back to the point about black sections, I was a part of that movement, a founding member. I became the chair of it in the early days for two years. I was uh, the leader when we, four of our members got into Parliament and made history, Paul Wating, uh, Diane Abbott, Keith Vaz, and Bernie Grant. Um, so, of course, I believe in 
black self-organisation, self-organisation within the working class, and I've given the reasons why. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Jackie, what's your view on that? We can't hear her. Can you hear me? Now. Yep. Can you hear me yes, now? Yes, great. Okay. I think it's very limiting to refer to Marx in this matter. I mean, for goodness sake, when was Marx writing? You know, things have come on a little bit since then. And I think his work is open enough for us to understand why, for example, so many communists have actually looked towards black people as being, uh, having the position of being in the vanguard because they, uh, according to Marxists like CLR James, were actually the first peoples to become truly modern people, to actually suffer what industrialization does to humanity. So I think, you know, if we're just going to look at what Marx says about black people, you know, he didn't say uh, very much about Margaret Thatcher either, but we can extrapolate from what he says, you know, all sorts of things. Um, I, think, I think what we've got to be really clear about as well is the subtlety of what race is. Race is an indelible and ir in immovable sign of your class. Now, that doesn't actually mean that you can't get people like, you know, uh, lambing in the Labour Party or all that awful, those awful black people in the Tory party. You know, that can always happen. But, but I think it's much, it's really interesting to understand that intersection between race and class. If you understand uh, colour as, if you like, a stigma, that denotes your race. And certainly for any peoples uh, who have come from the British Empire, most black people in Britain have, it either singles them out as being the descendants of enslaved people or people who had the imperial yoke on them. And, and that's actually what we need. I mean, what we need to do is really look at, 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 at communists and, and revolutionaries like like Fanon and thinkers like that and CLR James to actually understand the importance of how race intersects with class and with politics. Mm. I mean, there is when, when you look, for example, at um, our history, the, the women's movement, the, um, the suffragettes, they were quite bourgeois, you know, it was a bourgeois women's movement that started off as says women only, you know, we're, we're fighting for women's rights, etc. And we don't care about class, we don't, we don't care about this, you know, it's a working class thing. And then you had Sylvia Pankhurst, the, the daughter of, of the founder, said, actually, no, it is class and gender, you cannot look at just one thing. And how do you, how do you combine the two? I mean, Jackie, Jackie started talking about this, how do you for you, how do you can, can combine black self-organization, but within, you know, making sure that somebody like, you know, Keith Vass doesn't come into the black section and takes it over. There are, there are problems, for example, with um, the Irish section in the Labour Party, isn't it? It's taken over by the right. So, yeah, typically. Yeah, terrible. <laughs> terrible. But, you know, this is um, using, I mean, the question of ID politics can be used by the right to take over sections, isn't it? Yeah, but you'll always have this mishmash, if you want to call it that in political mm. terms, of the bourgeoisie, the intelligentsia, being prominent in all sections of politics, in left politics. It's no different. I mean, what class was Lenin? What class was Trotsky? Engels was an industrialist and a multimillionaire. They have the time on their side. They have the education. They have the ambition to do better within their profession, within their career. Jackie just talked about the great late CLR James. And he once said, in the black struggle, there are broadly speaking two sets of demands. The demands of the black working class and the demands of the black middle class. They are both legitimate demands.
but they're different. And if I were to prioritize one over the other, it's the demands of the black working class. And so the phenomenon of the Kemi Badenox, mm. the Suella Bravamans, the Kwesi Kwartings, the Rishi Shunaks, the Preeti Patels, it's been with us since the beginning of this black struggle. There was Booker T. Washington in America who argued for black capitalism. These people have been around for hundreds of years. They exist in Africa, they exist, they exist in Asia, they exist in the, the global south. We d can't discount their presence. Are they an example of an advance for African, Caribbean, Asian mm. uh, people, people of color? No, they're not, because they fight for their class interest. They're elitists, they went to public school, they went to you know, elite universities, they're millionaires, that's what matters to them, not their colour. And so we should never expect anything from them, in fact they're part of, a, of the problem, not part of any solution. But I'll be a bit controversial here and say, are they helpful in terms of saying to people uh, from our race or races, uh, you can reach any position, high position in society, mm -hmm. maybe they are. And there are better people out there who actually are, uh, uh, you know, sort of interested in class politics and left politics and are socialists that might be encouraged uh, to come forward and, and get into politics. Uh, but overall, we know that they're part of the oppressive elitist mm -hmm. class and we fight against them as hard as we can, as much as we fight against uh, uh, the, the white elite capitalist uh, 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 enemy. Mm. Um, Jackie, is somebody like Kemi Badenoch, do you think she's, she's encouraging black no, people to become I politicians? Couldn't disagree. I couldn't disagree more. I mean, one thing I will say, of course, it's the same story as in the white working class. You know, you'll get the West Streetings who will tell you their stories or, you know, uh, all of these people will tell you they, their stories of coming up from the working class and this this fantasy about uh, how we can all, 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 all get there. No, are they any use to us? No, they demoralise the people who are oppressed. They demoralise them because they undermine their struggle. They give cover to our oppressors and they prolong a fantasy which says that we can all make it. Some of us do make it. And, and most of us who do make it, do it as a combination of the huge amount of good fortune uh, and the unusual context. So I don't see them as, as giving us uh, anything to look up to. In fact, I find them a total utter embarrassment. There's a, there's a, a man today who's all over the social media glorying of the fact and note this, what he says, he's the first black member of the NEC. Now, he's on the right, and he says he's the first black member of the NEC. I think what he means is first person of African descent, because we actually have had other people of colour on the, the NEC. Does that give me uh, hope? And uh, am, I, am I proud of his achievement? No, because he's done it by adopting a style and a type of politics which is actually there to keep us in our place. So I don't celebrate it in any way, I'm afraid. Mm. What about somebody like Barack Obama in the US? No, no Barack Obama really doesn't do it for me. You know, it, look, this is where identity politics really falls down. Because essentially, it's not about, you know, the colour of our skin or even our gender, or any of the other things. It's about the politics. Look, Tony Benn was one of the most aristocratic uh, 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 white men who's been on the left. I would trust him a thousand times before I would trust Lammy. And that's where simple identity politics totally falls down. 
Am I longing to have a woman leader of the Labour Party? Why should I? It depends on what her politics are. That's the beginning and end of it. So I think we have to hold these things in very careful balance Mm. and understand what blackness means and also what it doesn't mean. Mm. What about then um, efforts to, you know, bring more women, bring more black people into politics by having black only lists, selection lists, for example, for candidates, women only lists? I mean, does that generally, you think, foster black people to put themselves forward? Or does it actually make, similar to what we just heard, you know, enforce a sort of a careerist type? you know, trajectory that you have to become, in order to get onto that list, you have to be black, but you also have to have a certain, you know, politics to be, to get further. I think what we have to look at is uh, the inherent flaw in the Labour Party since it was founded in 1900. It is a careerist middle class vehicle with very little uh, political education going on. That's why people are drawn who are interested in political education uh, to some of the left leftist groups to get political education. The Heinz 57 varieties of Trotskyism uh, and it's a good thing. So they get their education, but they're not going to get it in the Labour Party. And the danger with what used to be called in the United States affirmative action is that it doesn't have a class component and it benefits it benefits middle-class people who want to get on and have the resources and the time to get onto those lists. Mm. Uh, I don't disagree with affirmative action, mm. but I do think it should have a class dimension. How do you do that, though? How would you...? I'll explain how you do it. Mm. Uh, the trade unions founded the Labour Party. They had a campaign for a time to get more working-class uh, representatives, not just in Parliament, but on councils. What's happened to that campaign? I think that they have a key role to play in making sure that that imbalance is redressed and, and, and it hasn't happened. And for me, that's a source of unhappiness. And I would like to, us to go back at some point to invigorating those sort of demands within the trade union. Although you could be from a poor background and still have, you know, pro-right-wing politics, I and mean, it doesn't automatically make you, you know, a socialist or more left-wing. Well, let's dig deeper into that then and say we need more left-wing, socialist, working-class candidates, both black and white, male and female, gay and straight, mm. disabled and able-bodied. That's what I'd like to see. Mm. But, so you, but you agree with black-only lists in I some seats? I fought for it mm. uh, in the black sections from 1983. In fact, I remember that when the women who we were, used to work with used to work with the Irish Uh, section and uh, lesbian and gay section, uh, the women were arguing for a woman on every shortlist where one is nominated. And we said to the women, uh, LAPRA, uh, Labour Women's Action Committee, it was actually called then, um, don't argue for that, go for all women shortlist, because if you only have one woman on the shortlist, a man's going to come through. And so it was a black section's idea put to them the idea of all women shortlist. They got all women shortlist to this day. We haven't got all uh, uh, black shortlist. And by the way, I think that those all black shortlist should be controlled by the local party and not by the national party because you'd have a different outcome in terms of the type of car- uh, candidate you would get from uh, a, Starmite, a Starmerite uh, leadership. Mm. Jackie, what do, you, what do you think about only black lists or only women lists? I think they've got huge amounts of problems that accompany them, like any selection process has. But I think rather than answer that question, I would ask, how are you going to change today's style of representation on the left? Because it's actually a disaster. Without black sections in some form like that, how do you propose changing it? Look at how white not just conferences at the moment. I mean, it's startling as a black person looking at conference, both on the floor, but also on the stage, how extremely white it is. 
And then you look at the Tory party and you see something very different. Now, there are complex reasons about that. Of course there are. But how are you going to get more black people into positions of power? There's another thing, of course, which is a problem. And Mark knows this as well as I do. Because as soon as a black person gets into any position of public influence, they are taken down. They are taken down. It is extraordinary how often it happens. And just look at what kind of things that Diane Abbott has had to stand. That's just one of the black MPs. But we know it's actually all of the black MPs have had to take this and actually have had very little protection from the party. And we also see it with, with Afana Bain. What's happened to her is an obscenity and absolutely no protection for her. So what we need to do is to look at the reasons why black people do not come into politics. I remember being reproved by uh, some, some very astute black people. I went to do um, a speech in, in Trafalgar Square. It was to commemorate the emancipation of, uh, of slaves. Um, and a group of people came around me. It was just when the whole Corbyn thing had happened. And we were talking about what was going to go on and what, what I'd been doing and my involvement in Momentum. And it was a group of young, articulate, very politically aware black people. And they said to me, you're crazy. And I said, why? And they said, they will take you down. Not only will they take you down, but they will take you to pieces. Every single black person knows that if you go into politics, you have a choice. You can either be David Lammy or you have to have the hide of a rhinoceros. And even that won't get you through. And if you, you transfer that from the, the, the sort of bigger level, you can do it to the smaller level as well within, within left groups. So, for example, I cannot tell you how many times I have felt such frustration of attempting to explain to white colleagues even the basics of black political history on the left. They don't know it. And not only do they know it, do they not know it, but they're not really interested in finding out. For them, anti-racism anti is all about being nice to black people in that sort of generalized liberal way. Whereas actually being aware of what's going on is finding out what has actually happened to black people who have intersected with the white empires. What has happened to the black people in Britain today? Why are they killed on the streets? Why do black mothers and black babies have such a appalling outcomes in terms of prenatal and neonatal care. Why do black uh, boys in particular have such bad outcomes? What is it? Why? Why are our psychiatric hospitals so full of black people? There are answers to this. It's not a mystery. We can find it out, but people don't know. They don't know because it doesn't have that kind of priority. Hmm. So I want to pick you up on something, though. When you say, you know, you're, you're black and you come into a position of, of power, you are taken down even by the left. Who's taking you down? I'm, I, you know, is it, not, is it not because you're a left winger? Is it not, is, is this Sarah Sultana getting grief because she's a, you know, a, a, a person of color? Is she getting grief because she speaks out and is a pain? Diane Abbott. <laughs> Wasn't that mainly okay. because she's, you know, a, a left winger? That's a very interesting question because I, I don't think it has to be one or the other. Yes, in part, that's why it is. But I've been in left groups. And look, how racism works is that people feel, they feel uncomfortable when a black person speaks out plainly about racism. There's all sorts of academic research on this which shows you the actual emotional response that white people have to black people speaking out about their experience. It is a reality. 
and it happens on the left as well. Hmm. Do you feel people take you down on the left because of your colour? I was taken down. But because of your colour or because of what you said? I was said? expelled from the Labour Party oh. in 2018 on a trumped-up charge, bringing the party into disrepute. But the you last... feel this had to do with your colour as well? I'm going to well. explain that. I'm unpacking Sorry. it. Hmm. Which is the last refuge of the scoundrel, using administrative means to get rid of your political opponents. Jackie Walker was taken down in her own momentum, which she helped set up as the vice chair. And yet, people like uh, the leader of the Baker's Union, Andrew Fisher, mm. uh, people like uh, um, Ken Livingston, first time round who rather than being expelled, was his suspension was just extended. Uh, so when Jeremy Corbyn and his mates in Lotto wanted to help people, uh, they did. But they didn't help Jackie second time round. They didn't help me at all. And I think that's racialized. And I'm probably being controversial in saying so. It's probably unconscious. But you look at what Jeremy Corbyn said in his contribution to the Home Affairs Select Committee in front of Kifaz when he stoutly defended Seamus Milne, a white bloke, who, like him, went to public school, and threw me under a bus. My name wasn't mentioned in that meeting until Jeremy Corbyn mentioned me and said, ah, oh, uh, an event at the launch of the Chakrabarti report, a Momentum supporter, that was Mark Wadsworth. He's written a few books. He's a figure on the London left. I don't agree with him most of the time, but I support him, I agree with him some of the time. What was that all about? And people don't know about this. Mm. And they need to go back into their parliamentary records uh, and see what's, what's going on. They've put forward now this guy, Abdi Duali. Jackie referred to him. He calls himself the first African man to get elected to the Labour NEC. He tried to grasp me up. Nobody knows this yet, but they will know. And uh, one of the charges against me was an incident involving him and me uh, at Parliament. And that was one of the charges to get me expelled. It was a pack of lies, uh, what he said about me. And that was the only charge, actually, that the panel uh, didn't find in, in favour of. So it was knocked out. And yet now he's on the NEC as the darling of the Luke Akehurst right wing. Mm -hmm. He'll do nothing. He'll just be wheeled out to uh, provide window dressing for him. He won't fight for black rights. And, and we see that in the, in the Tory party. Mm. You know that you've got these individuals that uh, may, may be our skin folk, but they're not our kin folk politically. Mm. On the other hand, I was expelled very early on. I'm very white. Tony Greenstein was expelled. He's very white. Graham Bush, you know, a lot of white people get expelled as well, though. But right, Jackie, do you think that even in the Corbyn leadership, there was an issue with unconscious racism then, as Mark said? Oh, well, you know, I think the problem with discussing this is that we're almost going into another territory. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, what has been going on since the Al Jazeera, the most recent programme, is is a, an avoidance of the fact that actually the witch hunt started under Jeremy Corbyn's leadership. That's where it started. Now, you can say he didn't have control of the disciplinary. Let's just give him that. But certainly when I was expelled, he did have control of it by Jenny Formby. And actually I was one of the cases where he, where actually... Uh, the leadership was pulled up because they had interfered. Not to do me any good, but to actually get my case seen, heard faster. Now, I don't know, and I'm not going to judge, it's not one of those things, I'm, you know, you have to have all sorts of bits of evidence to understand that, what happened. But I do know, for example, that the way that I was dealt with by the media had extraordinary racist overtones. I do know that when I actually was at my hearing 
and I and I had and I saw no black faces in front of me uh, except for the woman who was making the coffee. That has a huge effect on me. I also know that when I actually asked for the racist material that I was uh, being told to look at, which included racist caricatures of me, and I asked those to be removed from the evidence pile, that they weren't removed. I do understand that if we'd been talking about my Jewish heritage, it would have been a very different thing. Mm. Well, you're, see that you're referring to a hierarchy of racism during that period. Um, how did you experience a hierarchy of racism? Is that in the Labour Party, is that a problem, ongoing problem? There is a hierarchy of racism and it's mentioned in the Ford report. The Martin Ford mm. uh, QC report that uh, investigated uh, a leaked dossier of evidence uh, that pointed the finger at the saboteurs in South I uh, Southside. Labour Party headquarters, uh, who, by the way, were given six-figure uh, sums of money by Keir Starmer's administration, despite being in the wrong. Talk about robbers and thieves and traitors. Mm. Uh, I'm so pleased that the Al Jazeera programme, go and go and look at it on um, uh, YouTube, uh, the Labour files, has uh, called them out, has taken down uh, the absence of decent journalism, of the panorama, disgraceful uh, show fronted by John Ware, uh, that hammer of the right wing, mm. who Ofcom should have uh, censured and sanctioned, but that of course hasn't happened uh, to the state broadcaster. Um, there's a lot there, isn't there? You know, I went to a, um, the World Transform meeting yesterday uh, at, ironically, a centre in Liverpool called the Blackie. Mm. And what struck me, there were more than 100 people in the audience, was it must have been 99% white and about 80% over 50. So it didn't look like the world transformed to me, Momentum's world transformed. It looked like the world stood st still or gone backwards. And um, I don't know how many black people are watching today, but we really need to do better as the left in terms of... Uh, including black people, uh, accepting black self-organisation, black self-determination, black leadership of our own struggle, nothing about us without us, is, which is what we're saying in this new anti-racist uh, initiative called the Liberation Movement. Um, and that's where we haven't got it right in, in the past. Black people speak in their own voice on their own behalf. Uh, and uh, because of our oppression, we're likely to be among the most militant sections of the working class. Mm. And so if you're going to have a fight back against reaction, against the right wing, uh, against neoliberalism, we need to be in the forefront mm. with you. Jackie, why do you think um, black people don't get as involved in politics, left-wing politics, right-wing politics? I mean, you see now a very diverse government, but you know, sort of on the left, it is true, isn't it? You, you do see very few people will get involved in the left. But why is that? Because I mean, they're, they're, they're the most oppressed. Why won't they join us to fight back? The reasons I've just said, I mean, I know it's very hard. Um, and I do sympathize with somebody who's white to understand what happens as a black person when you walk into a majority or usually an all-white group. It is not always a relaxed discussion, a relaxed reception. And that went for me from the time I was in the CLP till when I was in Momentum, till I was on left-wing groups. You know, if I was trying to put forward a black point of view, there was either a total lack of real understanding because there was such a, a, a level of ignorance around black history and the conditions of, of black people. There was a kind of attitude too often that, do we really have to do this? Uh, you know, okay, I suppose we'd better have. And then you have, of course, the times when you're kind of used, and you're used on the left, just as the right needs you, there's a bit of black cover as well for you know, different things. And it's, it's, 
It's actually politically exhausting to be black. It's politically exhausting to be black. And I think just like my friends that I met in Trafalgar Square said, they don't want to be destroyed. Where they put their political statements into is music and theater and dance and creativity and action on the streets. And they do that because they haven't found welcome on the left. Can I say that you asked the question, why aren't black people, more black people in the movement? And by that we mean African, Caribbean, Asian, people of color. But we're involved in politics. Look at the Black Lives Matter mm. uh, movement throughout the world. Hundreds of thousands of black people marching daily in a way that we would, on the left, absolutely sort of um, crave that we could manage that type of mobilization mm. day after day. Black people are involved in politics. Black working class people are involved in trade unions, in the Labour Party. Are they informal left groups or Labour Party structures? No, but they're deeply political. We're deeply political. Uh, a young uh, man, 24-year-old, Chris Carver, unarmed black man, shot dead in his car by armed police, just round the corner from where I live in Streatham. Thousands of people have been coming onto the streets. Mm. What have I noticed? Where have the white people been? There are some allies, but where are the trade unions? And I've said this to the trade unions about Black Lives Matter. So in a way, you have to ask the question the other way around. Where are white left-wing people when we need them on the streets fighting on our issues on our terms? Mm. But if we want to overthrow capitalism, we all need to be in one organisation, ideally, don't we? We need to have one fist striking. How do we create that fist? How do we bring, you know, or maybe we have to revolutionise our own groups as well. I mean, there are, not, there are not many women involved either because they are often in CLP meetings are incredibly boring. It's like they've been designed to be as boring and off-putting as possible and divorced from what's going on in real life. But how can we, you know, a movement like Black Lives Matter, how can we integrate this more? Where, where does the movement need to come, you think? The Look, Jackie and I have both been explaining this. Mm. Maybe it's on deaf ears sometimes. Um, but, you know, show that you care. Be involved in our struggles. And then we're going to see that you're serious about fighting racism side by side with us. And we're going to come into your organisations as well. It can't be a sort of standoff. Uh, and that's what I see at the moment. You know, it seems to be like two different struggles. And it shouldn't be, because it should be one against oppression, uh, the global south rising up against the imperialism and colonialism uh, of the uh, global north. Uh, and so I think we have to be more nimble, more tactical, uh, and less saying, well, we've got it all right as white Marxists in Europe. I criticise it in my book. I call it Eurocentric uh, communism. Uh, in fact, I believe that if you go far, far enough back in history, communism comes from the global south. We've been doing it for hundreds of years. It's just that Marx, Lenin and Engels and Trotsky put it into uh, tracks that people uh, now read as the British wrote the socialism or, uh, you know, the communist manifesto. Uh, we've been doing it for years and there are criticisms of, of Marxism about the way that, for instance, uh, the, the Communist International saw the Indian communists or communists in, uh, uh, in Africa as subsidiaries, almost affiliates to their superior European communism. For instance, the uh, Indian Communist Party, as I mentioned in my book, uh, was subservient to the Communist Party of Great Britain. Did you know that? Mm, no. They took their instructions from London mm -hmm. via the Communist mm. International in Moscow. That can't be right. No. Do you think it's right? No. <laughs> no, no. So, you know, there have been mistakes. Mm, yeah, made oh, plenty. By I mean, Marxists, mm, yeah. even at the highest level. Yes, yes, yes. I mean, the, the, the history of the trade union movement as well in, in Britain is, is difficult, isn't it? I mean, they, um, 
try to keep black people out for a long time because it, you know, it lowers wages if you get too many people working. So if you have a sort of elite at the top, the same with women, you know, trying to keep women out of the trade union movement um, to not reduce wages too much, etc. So it's, um, you think it's a, in the trade union movement also still an ongoing problem? Of course we've got a struggle in the trade union movement. Lenin called the general secretaries and the like uh, the aristocrats of labour. Uh, sometimes, I'm not saying some of the leftists like uh, David Ward, who I get on very well with, or Sharon Graham, uh, uh, are um, uh, of that ilk. Uh, but they still act, you know, as sort of um, sometimes, um, you know, the people at the top, passing tablet, tablets of stone uh, downwards. I would like to see a resurgence of the shop stewards movement, grassroots movement uh, of industrial militants. Uh, and a democratisation of the trade unions, mm. which would benefit not just Definitely. white members, but black members, women uh, members, uh, so that more Sharon Grahams come through, uh, black militants like her coming through to, to senior positions. Mm. Uh, there's a lot we've got to discuss in this very short amount of time. Mm. Uh, and I think it's not just a white conversation on the left, it's a black conversation. We have a big contribution to make in terms of our knowledge, our skill set our experience of how best to execute this struggle. Mm. Um, looking at the other side now, so say um, in a Labour Party meeting and somebody says something that you perceive to be racist. Does that, does that happen and what is, the, what is the response to deal with it? I'm asking because we have obviously had six, seven years of the anti-Semitism crisis and the response to, and we know that was for political reason, but the response was zero tolerance. I, you know, there's, you cannot, if you say something racist, that means you're racist and you're out. Um, Jackie, I'm going to talk to you about that first because you, you have quite strong views on, on, on that, the need to educate as well, isn't there? Well, you know, there is a difference, a huge difference between saying something which is racist and being racist. And I think we've got to be really clear about that. We live in a society which is structured around race lines. Uh, our education, our media, everything around us teaches us how to be, if you like, racist. My grandchild who came home recently to me and told me how much she didn't want to have brown skin. You know, there's reasons why she's coming back and saying that kind of thing. It's not just, uh, you know, by chance at all. So I think we've got to understand there is a difference. What do you do? Well, what you do is really you hope that it's not just the black people who have to put their hand up and say this is something which is actually racist. That's the first thing. If it's a black person who's calling out racist, it's, it's all already a problem. It's already a problem. So that's the thing that shouldn't happen. So it should be white comrades calling out racism. And then what you don't do is point a finger and start screaming at that person that they're a racist. If you want to turn somebody into a racist, it's by shouting at them, expelling them, and telling them that they're the racist. What you do is, and again, like I say, it shouldn't just be the black people who do it, is that you explain why that uh, remark, let's take it as a remark, is not acceptable, and not acceptable for everybody's good. It's not about being nice to the black people in the room, because racism, as was always said, hurts us all. That's the whole point of it. Racism hurts us all. So one of the terrible costs of the last, I don't know, five, ten years in politics is the ruination of how racism is dealt with. We now have a situation where the hierarchy of race is not just acting out, in the Labour Party, but it's now enshrined in, in virtually every disciplinary code 
everything else that you can get. So we we really can't accept that that's that's fine. That's okay. And that's one of the things that we have to object to, and that's very hard when you have a Labour Party which forbids conversation about Ford, which has made any discussion around anti-Semitism or on Israel so dangerous that people are terrified to speak. How do you make races into anti-racist? It's through conversation, it's through dialogue, and it's through learning. Mm. Um, my daughter actually came to me the other day and she said, oh, I, I don't, I'm, I feel afraid to use the word race. I feel afraid to, to say, is that racist? She's actually, I think it's, it's, it's really gone into society further that she, perhaps through the anti-Semitism debate, I don't know, but, but she doesn't dare, she wouldn't want to speak to you, for example, Jackie, about your experiences with racism because she feels she's, you know, stepping into a, a, a problem there or she's insulting you if she even mentions that. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's, it's a real cost and it's a loss. And actually, funnily enough, it, it really, um, it, it gives racist power because that's what they want. They want to separate people from each other. And the way you do that is first of all by having race used as a political football, the weaponization of it, which undoubtedly, by the way, it's what's happened. It's establishing a hierarchy where, for example, I know, I know as an actual fact that black people are scared to stand up and say what they feel about what's happening in the Labour Party because they know what will happen to them. This is a disaster for racial harmony and, and for integration in any way. Mm. Um, Mark, then in terms of this question of, of zero tolerance, I mean, we, we said it, it has been weaponized in the last seven years. So, you know, if somebody um, says something stupid, the Rothschilds, they don't understand, they don't actually, I think often they didn't understand what that means, that it has, you know, anti-Semitic undertones, etc. And they were thrown out straight away for political reasons as well, of course. Do you think there's a, there isn't a, there isn't a, a, a similar thing going on with anti-black racism, but that's probably, do you know what I'm trying to say? It's not a bad thing. I think it's wrong to expel people for saying one stupid thing or two stupid things, and it's better to talk to them. Do you agree with that, or do you think it's um, somebody says something racist? Zero tolerance on any level against any hatred uh, sounds quite appealing, doesn't it? In an absolutist sort of a way. Mm. But I don't think I agree with it. I agree with debate. Mm. I believe in winning the argument. I don't believe in cancelling people and no platforming people. I mean, I draw a, a line when it comes to fascists who actually want to kill me and people like me and others. Um, but in the main, uh, I'm for, like Jackie, discussion, robust discussion, uh, that it's the role of white people to call out each other when hatred rears its ugly head. Uh, the same for uh, heterosexuals, able-bodied people, um, people in positions of privilege. It's their job to fight discrimination. And so uh, I hope that answers your question. Just, well, As an addition, yeah. really, to what Jackie's yeah. just said. Yeah. I and mean, it's also in terms of, um, you know, the, the, there's lots of prejudice in society. I mean, racism exists, uh, clearly. Uh, Anti-Semitism exists. Racism exists even more. If you, if you say to anybody who says something stupid on the question or makes a joke, you know, you're a racist and you can't be a socialist or you can't be with us, you're beyond the pale, that also means they can't change. It means they can never be one to socialism. They can't change their mind when I think most people can, are quite capable of listening to arguments and, and understanding, you know, maybe that's actually quite wrong. There's actually... Things are changing, aren't they? And the people like the Daily Mail, the Telegraph will call this woke. You know, this is a bad thing that we're re-examining our slave history. It's a woke thing. 
Um, no, I think, I think we should maybe reclaim the word woke. <laughs> well, it's what they call the culture wars, isn't it? Yeah. Which I can't quite get my head round. I can't get my head round critical race theory. Someone had to explain it to me the other day. Uh, we don't talk about it down my pub in Croydon. Explain critical race theory to I us. I can't. Then. I can't. I'd have to ask Teo Luku or Jackie Walker to explain it to me. Look, I don't move in those circles. Mm. I'm the boy from Birmingham who grew up in a children's home, <laughs> lived on a Roma uh, uh, trailer site, uh, dragged myself up uh, by some straps. As Martin Luther King said, it wasn't our bootstraps because we didn't have boots. Um, but we don't have those discussions. It's a bourgeois intellectual uh, gig that's going on there and a lot of these conversations, intersectionality, I like the idea of it, uh, uh, ticking so many boxes when it comes to intersectionality and I won't go into that because <laughs> I'm not going to give you an exclusive. Um, but you know some of these conversations are happening when people are facing uh, a cost of living crisis, choosing between eating or heating. That's what concerns them and whether we're on their side in this fight against a vicious Tory government attacking the working class, mm. black and white. Mm. Uh, and those are the conversations I want to have with the trade unions, with the labour movement, with uh, uh, activists like yourself. We clearly need more discussion on those issues. And I think we, we touched on a few things today, but uh, we have to dig much deeper. So we're joined by Teo as well. Hello. Hello. Nice to see you again. So can you explain uh, critical race theory to us? <laughs> Can you? Oh, go, go on. <laughs> no, I can't. You can't? <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you an interesting uh, example of something that happened to me quite recently. Um, I went to an event and a friend of mine said she was surprised to see me and that she wasn't sure whether I would actually be at liberty because I had been arrested twice recently for being part of a Palestine action. Uh -huh. uh, uh, protest, in inverted commas, where some damage was caused to uh, Elbit Systems factories. And this friend of mine, who is of Nigerian heritage, um, said she's been wanting to talk to me about that. She doesn't know why I am standing up for Palestinian people, because Palestinian people have a word for us black people which is the equivalent of slaves. And I said nothing, but I was quite stunned, quite disappointed. But there is a lot of education that needs to be done from among white people, among, among us black people, to see, to show that, you know, that kind of thinking just continues to divide us from the struggle that needs to happen of all people, of all races, cultures, religions, whatever, to keep our focus on the fact that there's one enemy that we all need to fight together. So whether how that fits into critical race theory, I do not know. But to me, it's a theory that I think is uh, worth uh, bearing in mind. Can I say this is a wonderful person who had the privilege of recruiting to be the lead actor for a BBC program I made oh. called The Amazing Life of Alaudo Equiano, who was a freed, enslaved uh, African in the 1700s who wrote a best-selling book for the abolitionist movement that went to nine editions. And yet, yet again, it's a white saviour, William Wilberforce, yes. that we would talk about in school mm -hmm. as the person who freed us. And so I was able in some way to help correct the historical record uh, with this program. I don't know how I got on, <laughs> but I did. Very and lucky. so did Tayo. Yeah. Um, I think we did quite a good job. We did we? quite a good job. And thank you for inviting me to do it. My pleasure. Well done, Comrade. So check it out. It's on BBC Sounds. There's an advertising plug there. The Amazing Life of Alauda mm -hmm. Equiana. And we can put that in some yeah. sort of chat. Cool. Or get and, that um, out there. Yeah, Jackie. Sorry. Jackie, you want can to come I actually explain? Uh, what critical race oh, of theory course, no, is. Yeah, of course. And I do think it's actually quite important that we have black people 
uh, working on all sorts of levels of yeah. anti-racism. So I think to work on the theoretical level here is very important. It fundamentally, it's about the way that racism is not an aberration of capitalist society. It's not abnormal. It is actually a social construct that comes out of modern capitalist society. And it is involved in all sorts of ways that we live. It's, it's very simple and it's actually very important. And the fact that it's been attacked so much, particularly in America, but now here as well in our universities, is a sign of what powerful idea that is. I.e. racism in our country is not aberrant. It is the norm. And it is a race, and it is a social construct. Thank you, Jackie. And do you identify um, racism as being um, linked with class society or with capitalism? I and mean, with capitalism is the clear, you know, the slavery linked to slavery, or, or does it precede, you know, does it precede yeah. the advent of capitalism? So there is a huge difference between xenophobia and racism, mm -hmm. right? And, and when I'm talking about racism, I'm talking about the racism which was a construct of capitalism, which on which slavery and imperialism was built. Now, people say, well, look back in, to Rome. They had slaves then. Actually, it was a totally different uh, uh, category of, of slavism, of, of slavery. So, for example... You weren't denoted as a slave because of the way you looked or from where you came from. And once you were emancipated, I'm using the language of today, which is not the language they would have used in ancient times, you could become a citizen of Rome and black people did, in fact, become emperors of Rome. So I'm seeing what we understand today as racism as an unavoidable consequence of capitalism. And the link to slavery, could you, could you explain that a little bit more, why you see um, well, slavery as being integral? Totally. totally. How on earth can you treat uh, those people who are enslaved as no better than animals? You do it by actually making them conceptually subhuman and that's what they had to do for slavery particularly on the level that it was played out you know in the british empire and the french empire and the spanish empire and the portuguese empire and in the americas for it to actually be used by capitalism in the way it did there was only one way it would work and can i just tell you i went to a, a plantation in the southern States of America. It was the most successful uh, plantation in the whole um, area, in the whole, you know, uh, region. And what it was is that the slave mistress had worked out exactly that she only needed a slave to live for 15 years to get a proper profit from them. And also, she didn't allow slaves, mostly enslaved peoples, were encouraged to make and grow their own food, but not on this plantation. She centralized that. She centralized that so she could control exactly what they ate. Black people not only were part of a society of commodification, their whole bodies were commodified. They had a value. Their reproduction had a value of it. That's how it works as a basis of capitalism. Mm. And do you think that when be predating um, slavery, you know, in the 1300s, somebody saw a black person, xenophobia, what is what you would describe happens rather than a, the form of racism well, that then you, Interestingly enough, there are records of, of black people in Britain going back to Roman times, but certainly in the 15th century, for example, in the Scottish court and in the English court and in London. And actually, black people weren't seen 
as being uh, uh, subhuman in any way. They were actually talked about as being, if you like, quite exotic. And, um, you know, they were just seen as being foreigners. I mean, if you want to read more about it, there's plenty of material about it. And you have people, you know, philosophers like Montaigne, who wrote about about those people. And the fact that European philosophy so changed between the time of Montaigne and, and at the time of slavery was because European American development depended on the commodification of people of color. Mm. That is fascinating. Mark, do you, do you agree with that assessment? If you ask today, racism, you know, there's nothing you can do about it. It just exists. People are, you know, it's like a, presented as a normal thing. People are just born with being racist and there's nothing we can do about it. But do you see it's also linked to the advent of, of capitalism? Of course, the justification of subjugating people of colour as a labour force. And then after that, you got super exploitation, didn't you? Mm. That's how IKEA and these stores exist. Primark, because you've got children of colour in the global south making their products. And that's how you as a consumer, not you personally, You're Tina. looking but at me like that. <laughs> <laughs> white consumers in the global north are greatly benefiting from that. So it's still continuing. Child labour. Um, so this whole process of exploitation is a continuum. Is it inevitable? No. Nobody's born racist. People become racist. Mm. You know, I helped in the Stephen Lawrence campaign, Justice for Stephen Lawrence, the murder of an 18-year-old uh, black youth in Eltham in South East London. And the murderers, we know who they are, white working class guys, grew up with black people in that area. What happened? They were going to uh, Stephen's house, other pe black people's houses, eating curry goat and rice and peas. Why did they flip? It's economics. It's about poverty. Poverty not just economic, but political. That the ruling class are able to pit one section of the class against another, the divide and conquer tactics, so that they, the minority, the one percent, stay on top. It's not rocket science to no. work it out, is it? No, but then can we actually get rid of racism within capitalism, or does it take the overthrow of capitalism to really get rid of it? I'm gonna, not going to help you with your Marxist <laughs> theory. <laughs> Well, if, it profited, if it profited capitalism for racism to end, yeah. they could end it. It's as simple as that. Jackie, do you think you could... <laughs> sorry, could we actually end <laughs> racism, you know, without ending capitalism? Well, you know, what I'm saying is if we wanted... Even if, mm. if capitalists wanted it to end, they could end it, but they don't want it to end because it would have all sorts of ramifications on how power works and how money flows. So, I mean, that's your issue. I mean, yes, it could, but no, it won't, is the answer. <laughs> because, of your, I mean, officially laws, you know, British, the British laws aren't racist anymore, are they? They are anti-racist, yeah. you know, it's supposed to discriminate against black people, etc. They are, well, you tell people uh, waiting to be deported that their British law isn't racist. You ask people like me who have a second passport and could have a knock on the door at any point and be deported supposedly to an, the country uh, where I'm from, whether British law is racist. You go and have a look and see how our court system works and ask whether our laws are racist. Racism, I'm going to say this again, racism is not an aberrant part of capitalist societies. It's within the structures, it's within our vocabularies, it is everywhere. 
Thank you, Jackie. Last word from you, Mark? About what? This programme's been very good. Thank you very much, Tina <laughs> Workman, Phil, Ali, um, Cal, Linda. You're a great team. And uh, I look forward to uh, seeing the recording because some people have messaged me to say that they've had difficulty yeah, we have some logging on. So the sooner you get that recording yeah. uh, made available, I'll make sure it's disseminated widely. Yeah and circulated. Great. Thank, Thank you me. very much for joining us. Thank you, Jackie. Um, not sure we clarified it all, but I think it's important to have discussions with that. And I, I did ask questions that I normally wouldn't dare asking, but I think if we do it in this context, it's, you know, like How a safe How do you feel? Space. Have you learned anything? <laughs> I think I have, You yes. said it was a learning exercise yes, for it, you. I think, yes, I think we've, I have. It's definitely, I think Jack, Jackie also, I think, made a really important point, and this is it is crucial that we, we learn about black history and we don't, we don't do it on the left. That is, that is true. And I would like, to, I mean, you've made a start and recently you've introduced the Comrade Sack to us in an in yes. education session, but we do need to do more of that work, definitely, yes. and to understand. And I critique better. communism. I mean, I'm broadly speaking a communist, but there are criticisms to be had. My cousin in Finland, Joko Kajanoja, was the leader of the Finnish Communist Party. You'll be aware that Italy, France and Finland had the largest communist parties and were in government. And he says, look, you've done some useful work, cousin, unearthing some dirty passages in our histories. Uh, and it's, it needs to be done for us to go forward. Mm. That doesn't mean that you're, you know, dumping on a, a very fine tradition, uh, but we've got to be self-critical and we've got to do better as the left, I think. Always, and I think this this program, this event, is very much part of challenging our ideas and debating things out and hearing different viewpoints. So I did enjoy that. Thank you very much, both Mark and, and Jackie.